Tell me a little bit more about Disaster Day. What is that? That is the nation's largest uh, disaster simulation. Okay. And so us in athletic training and then all of the other allied healthcare fields, including School of Nursing, School of Medicine, um, we all come together and it's a student-led project where they you know, create a scenario, create a, a situation, I don't know, a hurricane or a train derailment or something like that. And we go over to that uh, disaster city here in College Station and they kind of act out different scenarios and situations. Welcome to On The Move from the Texas A&M Department of Kinesiology and Sport Management. Howdy, and welcome to On The Move. I'm Chelsea Reber, and today I'm visiting with Dr. Pat St. Louis. Dr. St. Louis, thank you for joining us on On The Move. Yes, thank you very much for having me. So explain to me what you do in the department. Yeah, so I'm within the athletic training program here, and so my role is the coordinator of undergraduate education, and what that means is I basically help to oversee our 3 plus 2 and 4 plus 2 track students that are interested in going into athletic training. Okay. Um, so explain real quick, since we, we went ahead and threw out the 3 plus 2, 4 yeah. plus 2, what exactly that is within the athletic training program. Yeah. So it's just two different tracks that students can come in. If they come in as a freshman, um, they can declare athletic training and then basically get a master's degree in five years instead of the traditional six. Okay, um, so the three plus two is exactly. where the, the five comes in. Yeah, okay, yep, definitely. excellent. So how did you choose to do the undergraduate education part of this scenario? Yeah, so athletic training was at the bachelor's level for a long time, and then we recently switched to master's. And so that undergrad kind of student and just seeing you know the excitement when they come in, uh, just really drew me to that that opportunity to kind of follow up with the undergraduate students. And it's just fun to see them kind of have those aha moments and, and see that kind of, I don't know, passion for the profession kind of grow from that level. So are you a trained athletic trainer? I am. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. What, what got you into that field? What made you want to pursue that? Yeah. So originally, I had no idea what athletic training was. Um, I went to college on a soccer scholarship and then got hurt. And so we had an athletic trainer there. I wanted to do physical therapy, kind of realized that these two tracks are very similar, and then just kind of never looked back after that. So, How does that experience kind of help you relate to some of the students that you teach? Yeah, a lot of our students come in with that mindset, right? PT, OT, kind of the traditional ones that way, because there's so much publicity with that. And so a lot of students have no idea what athletic training is and then throw out that we can do all these different things, all the different manual therapies and modalities. And it kind of draws students back in. Uh, if I can work with the athletic population instead of maybe more of that geriatric pa uh, patient population that they're looking at. Tell me a little bit about your teaching style and what makes it unique. Yeah, so I first day, um, I go through the syllabus and I always tell my students, the first thing on my mouth is, I absolutely hate to hear myself talk. Oh. And so, you know, I- Welcome to the podcast. Exactly, yep. <laughs> and so from day one, they know that I'm not going to just stand up there and lecture. Um, I like to have them do hands-on. I like to have them do, you know, gait assessment or get up and move and interact with their uh, their colleagues and their peers. And the other thing is, no matter if it's a, a class of, you know, 16 students or a class of 100, I always make them do an introductory video um, kind of discussion post. That way I can put a name to a face. And I just kind of pride myself on knowing my students, right? From a first name basis, I can pick them out in the hallway and have conversations. And so I bring that into the classroom as well. It makes my life easier if no one's volunteering for things. I can say, hey, you know, Jake, come on up. Or, you know, Susie, come on up and have them come on, uh, you know, serve as a model for us in that uh, process. Is there anything that you implement that is maybe not so common in some other athletic training programs? Uh, so we do a lot of different things in terms of certification. Um, so for instance, today we went through a lot of cupping therapy. Mm, and so we yeah. see that, you know, with the Olympics and all the marks on everybody's back. I still remember the, the Summer Olympics that like everyone was like, what are those spots <laughs> on everybody? And then all of a oh. sudden cupping was all the rage. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And so we have that traditional cupping, but this morning I brought in fire cupping. And so Okay, we, tell me more. What is that? So that's basically using a huge you know, fireball and you use glass cups and you put the fire in there, suck out all the oxygen. So when you place it down on the skin, it actually kind of decompresses it and pulls wow. it up a little bit better. So, okay. Yeah. Bringing fire into the classroom. Exactly. We got to try something, <laughs> right? Get their opinion. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love the hands-on approach because, I mean, that is what an athletic trainer does. You are using your hands on athletes or, or whoever, I guess, the subject yeah. would be. Yeah, so. definitely. Very yeah. cool. What opportunities are available outside of the classroom for students in this field? So here at AM, we do a lot of different things. And that's part of my role as that coordinator of undergraduate education is 
I get to see those students from basically their sophomore year. Um, I have them once a week in the class, and then they get to go out to any of the athletic sites here on campus. And so they get to observe our students, our graduate students, work with them hands-on, work with our athletes, and then work with the preceptors here. And so they get to have a lot of different opportunities, you know, at football and soccer and basketball and everywhere else um, that not a lot of places do for their undergraduate students versus their traditional master students. What is the relationship like between the undergraduate and the master students? Would you say that they're pretty close? They are, yeah. And we, we try to make that kind of a, a relationship that we strive for is we tell our master students that they're basically junior preceptors, right? They get to oversee and schedule and work with those undergrad students. And that allows them to have that opportunity to kind of fill that role in two short years when they're, you know, working professionals as well. Tell me what is the IMSAT? I'm assuming that's a, a test that students have to take eventually. Nope. Am so I saying that right? It no. Is, yep. <laughs> okay. And so the MSAT is just our master students. Oh, uh, so masters okay. in athletic training. Uh, but they do have to sit for their board exam, uh, their BOC exam at the end of their two years. Gotcha. So. so what is normally kind of one of the biggest surprises for students who are preparing for MSAT? A lot of it is kind of the rigor, right? Yeah. And the amount of time that they're going to have on task normally in classes and cl clinicals and practical exams and all that kind of stuff. But then we also have a research component. And mm. so if you think of like a traditional master's degree, it's around 30 to 35 credit hours. Ours is 60. And okay. so we wow. have a lot of classes, a lot of clinicals. They're traveling with teams. You know, they're going everywhere and doing everything with that. And so the rigor of the class, and then couple that with, you know, studying for their board exam, clinicals, and just trying to have a life as well yeah, um, definitely. is definitely important. So. Let's say a student is, you know, on like the three plus two track and, and they kind of get to the point where they're like, you know what, maybe this isn't for me. That commitment, like the, then maybe not continuing to get their master's. I'm assuming that can still go towards something. I, and yeah. I, I don't, yeah. I, I'm not trying to bring up a situation where a student fails or says, you know, okay, but, but for whatever reason, athletic training, this isn't for me anymore. Um, you know, what direction can students go instead? Yeah. So a lot of them just kind of transition into a kinesiology degree okay, and they stay within that track, graduate hopefully in the four years. And, Great. Okay. Um, stay on time, you know, with yeah, that. Yeah. And we try our best, you know, to, to help and guide them of sure. all these credits that you took, you know, really would set you up well for, you know, uh, exercise physiology track or the kinesiology track, or maybe they want to go into nutrition or something different, then we kind of help them get them plugged into those programs as well. If you'd like to learn more about the Department of Kinesiology and Sport Management, click on the link in the description below. You take a lot of pride in continuing to advance your skill set. What are some things that you're doing right now to do that? Yeah, so a couple of weeks ago, I was out in Albuquerque um, learning about kinesio tape, and I've been a certified kinesio tape instructor for them since I think like 2012. Oh, wow. Okay. And so trying to make that a reality that I can teach my students that um, kind of skill set, bring that into the classroom, certify them before they even graduate. And so we do that. Um, I do a lot of rodeo coverage. Oh, um, cool. To trying to keep my hands dirty and bring all those experiences back into the classroom. And then it also allows me to have those students up on the shoots with me. Um, I usually get to take two students a night up on the shoots. They get to see what rodeo medicine looks like uh, from I, that lens. I so. just read an article in Texas Monthly about a doctor who has been covering the rodeo scene for years and years and years. And it was fascinating just the stories that he had about some of these cowboys. And, yeah. and yeah. man, the injuries that they have. Yes. And that they compete with. Yes. It's wild. <laughs> it is. That's got to be a it really is. cool experience then for you and the students. It is. Yeah. And, and that's my philosophy, you know, is when the students are there, they're kind of running the show. Right. And obviously, if there's an emergency situation, I'll kind of take the lead and, and take opportunities. But they get to, you know, interact with those individuals and see them from their 18 all the way to, you know, 40s and 50s when they're still riding. Um, and so it, it is it's a great opportunity for them to expand. What is it like to to teach athletic training at a school like Texas A&M University, where you have an athletic department that is one of the top in in the country? Really, what is that kind of experience? Do you do you recruit a lot of students because of that? Yeah, we yeah. definitely do. Okay, yeah, they come here for that big D one SEC yeah. experience, so that is a great opportunity. But we do have a great working relationship with athletics, and so. They value our students, you know, and having that opportunity to come over and work as athletic training students and observe and see, you know, the day-to-day day -day operations of that. And so having that great relationship with athletics allows us to have a great program as well. 
What kind of, I guess, training or education goes into the person to person, the communication skills? I mean, obviously, you you got to learn how to tape, you got to learn how to assess and, and do all of the things that an athletic trainer has to do. But there has to be, I don't know, some kind of bedside manner that that students have to learn as well when they are treating athletes. Is that something that y'all talk about? There is. Yeah. We, we kind of harp on those soft skills, right? It starts from their interview when they interview to get into our program. That's kind of the thing that we look at too. Sure. Of can they actually have a conversation with us? Can they carry that on? And then how does that transpire into, you know, patient care and everything else? And so we integrate that into the classroom. We integrate that into practical exams. Um, we integrate that into assignments and everything else. Um, we have a great alumni base that comes in and that helps us in that piece too for when they're preparing for jobs. They serve as mock interview committees and they form their own committees and, and allow our, our second year students to go through that process as well. Yeah, so. very cool. Now, athletic training, and I think I remember this from one of our previous episodes with Dr. Greenfield, um, athletic training, it's not just about college sports or even professional sports, right? So what are some other opportunities for students who come through this program? Yeah, so one of our rotations that we have is with the Corps Cadets. Okay. And so military and tactical athletes, fire department, police department, those are all growing fields within athletic training. And so we work, you know, with different bases and uh, have athletic trainers that are out at those sites. And like I said, here on campus with the Corps, we also have our dance science um, rotation. And so they get to work with the performing arts. Um, it's another kind of growing field with, you know, ballet or Cirque du Soleil. Um, UFC is starting to, you know, Higher athletic trainers. Um, I, I just can talked see to why. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> Lots of injuries yeah. in that one. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yep. But even just down the road, um, I know that Costco hires athletic trainers. Really? And so they work on the ergonomics and making sure that people are, you know, lifting the boxes correctly or, um, you know, how they're kind of or orienting their body as well. Yeah, lots of opportunities then. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, very cool. Um, tell me a little bit more about Disaster Day. What is that? Yeah, so that is the nation's largest uh, disaster simulation. Okay. And so us in athletic training and then all of the other allied healthcare fields, including School of Nursing, School of Medicine, um, we all come together. And it's a student-led project where they you know, create a scenario, create a, a situation, I don't know, a hurricane or a train derailment or something like that. And we go over to a disaster city here in College Station, and they kind of act out different scenarios and situations. We have a lot of, you know, involvement from the community, a lot of involvement from all the different schools that, you know, people have moulage everywhere and, you know, fake injuries. And then those individuals, those students have to kind of treat them, triage, work through the field hospital from, you know, the first time that they see them all the way through discharge. And so it's a great opportunity for them to work interprofessionally, collaborate that way, and then also kind of let everybody know what athletic training is on the backside of that and advocate for our profession too. I was once traveling with an athletic team and half of us got food poisoning. The visiting athletic trainers, or, or we were the visiting team, but the home athletic trainers at the school we were visiting, it looked like triage in the, the training room the next day. They've got IVs, they've got oh, fluids. Yeah. And now that I think back on that experience, I mean, that those are the athletic trainers and they yep. truly were taking care of that situation, which to us was a disaster. Oh, yes. yeah, definitely. <laughs> so even something like that, athletic trainers are going to come through. Exactly. We're always there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What would be your advice to a student, high school student, or maybe even somebody who who's early on in their college career, they're kind of still trying to figure out what they want to do and they're thinking athletic training might be something. What's your advice to some students who are getting into the field? So definitely reach out, right? I mean, I have an open door policy here at AM, obviously. And so I'm always willing to help and meet with people. Um, my advice to those individuals is try to get their foot in the door somewhere where they can observe, see what this looks like from the day to day, see if that is something that they want to explore. And then again, talk to people in the field, talk to those athletic trainers that are allowing them to observe, Talk to us here as faculty that are teaching in our program. Anybody that has, you know, kind of that background experience, absolutely get connected and, and start networking for sure. You talked a little bit earlier about advancing your skill set and mm -hmm. going to different places and, and understanding new techniques and things like that. What are some kind of short-term goals for yourself and for this program? Yeah, I just want to continue to grow, obviously, as a clinician, uh, because I think that if I can't grow as a clinician, I can't really do my job as a, a faculty and so continuing to advance my skill set, whether that's, you know, dry needling or advanced certifications and trying to bring those back into the classroom. 
And same thing with our program. We continue to evolve our curriculum, you know, day in and day out, year to year, making sure that we're staying up on all the trends, all the new technology, new modalities, new everything that our students are going to see in the field, making sure that we're not outdated within the classroom. What are some of the newest trends going on right now? Uh, there's a lot of like deep oscillation therapy, manual therapies, dry needling is huge. Okay. Um, kinesio tape is still pretty big, all the colorful tape on everybody, yep, and, yep. You know, cupping therapies. And so it's always just continuing to advance within the, the manual therapies field. Do you see some stuff and you're like, okay, that's just, I don't know, yeah. that's silly. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> okay, yep. okay. Yeah, there's definitely some stuff and you're like, you kind of scratch your head a little bit. Yeah, of, I don't yeah. know how that works, but you know, if the patient feels better, great, we'll give it a try. There you, you go. Know, so. There you go. Well, Dr. St. Louis, thank you so much for joining yes. us today on On the Move. Yes, appreciate thank you very much. I appreciate it. If you're interested in learning more about the Department of Kinesiology and Sport Management, just click on the link in the description below. Thank you so much for listening, and please consider subscribing, liking, and sharing the podcast. This podcast is housed in the College of Education and Human Development at Texas A&M University, where we transform lives.